Today's video is a bit of a two-parter in measuring coax with the Nano VNA. In the first part, we'll take a look at uh, measuring the length or even a distance to fault in coax, probably one of the more common tasks you might use the VNA for. And this is using the transform function in the VNA. In part two, we'll take a closer look at transmission lines and the Smith chart and talk about things like impedance transformation due to a coaxial line, uh, the effect of SWR with transmission line length, and uh, even the magic of some quarter wavelength transmission line lengths or stubs, and a couple of other things. So stick around for part two. So let's get started. All right, we'll start with just the step-by-step -step procedure to use the transform to measure the length of this unknown hunk of coax here with the Nano VNA. And we only need a single trace to measure the length using transform. So we'll go into our settings and go to display under trace and we'll turn off everything except trace zero. And with trace zero set to channel zero, uh, we're gonna go to format and select linear or real. Either one of those will give us kind of the sharpest response in the transform. We then need to go to set up the transform. So we'll go back, back again go to transform and to measure uh, the length of coax we're going to use the low pass impulse response for the transform and then we go back in and turn the transform on and next we want to select the velocity factor for the coax this uh, RG8U has got the foam dielectric and that's typically a velocity factor between like 78 and 85 uh, we'll just put in 80 uh, for the velocity factor uh, when doing that on the Nano VNA, you don't want to put the decimal like 0.8. You actually want to put the percentage, so in this case, 80%. We set the stimulus next. Now, the low-pass transform needs to extrapolate down to DC, so we set the start frequency as low as possible. On the Nano VNA, that's 50 kilohertz. The stop frequency, though, is going to determine the maximum distance that the transform will measure over. The distance range and resolution are determined by that stop frequency. The higher the stop frequency, the shorter the total distance that you can measure. The lower uh, the stop frequency, the longer distance you can measure, but at a reduced resolution. Remember, we only have 101 points that we're dealing with. After playing around with the instrument, I kind of determined empirically uh, the relationship between the maximum distance you can measure and the stop frequency. And it comes down to this formula here. So if you figure that your coax is you know, no more than 20 meters or 25 meters long or whatever the maximum distance you want to measure is, you put that distance in meters here. So you take 5850 divided by that maximum distance multiplied by the velocity factor. Now in this case, the velocity factor is the decimal value. So if your velocity factor was 80%, you would put 0.8 here. And that will determine the stop frequency that you enter into the stimulus. It might be handy to start with even a lower frequency than this to give you a little more measurement range. And then if you find that your measurement is you know, real close to the start of the trace, you can start increasing the frequency to get better resolution. Uh, I can't imagine I've got any, you know, anything near, say, 20 meters of cable here. So what I can do is go to the stimulus, and if I use that formula uh, for 20 meters, I wind up with uh, 234 megahertz as my stop frequency. And I'll set it with something a little bit lower than that. So we set it to say 200 megahertz. That'll give us a good measurement range. And we can see if I pull that marker all the way over to the end, we can see that total measurement range is uh, 23.4 meters. Oh, and now we can hook up our unknown coax. Now we can use the marker search feature to go find that peak value. And by doing that, we can see that the peak is occurring at 9.13 meters. So that tells me that this coil of coax here is approximately 9.13 meters in length. Now of course if the coax had a short circuit in it somewhere or maybe a break in it somewhere or the first peak that we see would be an uh, indication of where that particular defect or fault is. But in this case the coax is good so what we're seeing is the end of the coax 9.13 meters away. So that's the simple process of measuring the length of a coax or distance to fault in a coax. And I'll make these notes available in a PDF uh, linked down below the video on the YouTube page. Now let's move on to part number two, looking at transmission lines and the Smith chart. Now when you connect a load to a source, like a transmitter to an antenna with a transmission line, one of the things that happens is that the transmission line will alter the impedance that's seen at the transmitter end if the load, such as the antenna, is not impedance matched to that transmission line. 
and this is due to the propagation delay of the reflection that comes back uh, at the transmitter side. And there's a lot of really ugly math that uh, describes that, but it's actually very easy to visualize on the Smith chart. What we'll see is on the Smith chart that adding or removing a transmission line essentially rotates the impedance around the, the Smith chart equidistant to the center of the Smith chart. It essentially draws a circle around the center of the Smith chart with a radius equal to the radial distance of that load impedance to the center. So visually it looks like this. Let's say uh, the load impedance that we're seeing at the antenna is right here. This circle that we've inscribed centered around the center describes all of the impedances that are possible depending on the length of the coax that's connecting that antenna to the transmitter. Now a couple of key points. One complete trip around the Smith chart represents a half wavelength long line. And since you're, we're winding back up at the same point on the Smith chart, that means the impedance looking into the line is equal to the impedance at the end of the line when the line is a half wavelength long. So we could say that the impedance repeats every half wavelength increment each time that transmission line is increased or decreased. The really more interesting case is when you go only halfway around the chart. That's a quarter wavelength long line. And there, the impedance looking into the line effectively inverts from what's seen at the other end. The relationship is actually this. So you have whatever that load impedance is compared to, or over the reference impedance, in most case 50 ohms, flips over to the reference impedance divided by uh, the load. So you essentially get this inversion of the impedance. In the extreme case, if the transmission line is left open at one end, and the, that line is a quarter wavelength long, it'll look like a short circuit at the other end at that particular frequency. And vice versa, if you have a short in the line and you go a quarter wavelength away, then that will actually look like an open. Now to illustrate how the impedance looking in from the source to a transmission line varies as the transmission line length varies, I put together this graphic on my phone where the source is indicated here and the load is the end of the coax, so this white area is essentially the length of our coax. Now this graphic is simulating that the load is an open circuit, so the blue incident waveform coming from the source is being reflected at full amplitude back towards the source. The reflected signal that's coming back towards the source is kind of like a back EMF. It combines with the source waveform to essentially determine what impedance the source sees looking into the line. You'll notice that some transmission line lengths, the reflected waveform is at the same amplitude as the source waveform. So under that condition, when those voltages match or are in phase, the source isn't really sourcing any current because the voltage it's producing is being opposed by the voltage coming back. So therefore, it looks like an open circuit. And since we said this was an open circuit at the load, that's the condition where the load impedance is being matched at the source, which means we're going to be an even multiple of half wavelength long. Now the opposite extreme is when the reflected waveform is exactly 180 degrees out of phase from the incident waveform. When that happens, those two voltages add up, they sum to zero. So it looks like the source is driving a short circuit. And we said that it's an open circuit at this end. So that's occurring when the length of the line is an odd quarter wavelength long, so like a one quarter wavelength, three quarter wavelength, five quarter, etc. And we see that on the Smith chart. We talked about uh, the impedance following a circle depending on the line length. So if we started at the open circuit position here, we go halfway around the Smith chart, we're at the short circuit position, we go halfway around again, and we're back at the open circuit position. So we just saw how that works in the waveforms, and that's how it's represented on the Smith chart. This leads to an interesting question and answer is, when does a 100 ohm resistor look like a 25 ohm resistor? The answer is when it's at the far end of a quarter wavelength line or any odd quarter wavelength multiple. So here's that situation illustrated on the Smith chart. So here's where a 100 ohm resistor would get plotted on the Smith chart. If we draw the circle, go halfway around the Smith chart, which is a quarter wavelength long, we're now at the 25 ohm position. Another halfway around, which is another quarter wavelength, we're back out to the 100 ohm position. So this is how a 100 ohm resistor can look like a 25 ohm resistor. Another way to think about this is that if you have some random length of coax connected to this 100 ohm load, the impedance looking into that line is going to lie somewhere 
on this circle. Now another thing we know is that a 100 ohm load in a 50 ohm system or a 25 ohm load in a 50 ohm system both result in an SWR of 2 to 1. The way that's illustrated on the Smith chart is if you take any impedance and draw a circle centered at the center of the chart and then where that circle crosses the center axis here drop straight down to the first of these radial scales and that reads SWR and we can see here this says 2 to 1. Now the implication here is that regardless of where we are on this line, meaning regardless of the transmission line length, that 100 ohm load is always going to represent a 2 to 1 SWR. Now this bears repeating because a very common misconception. Adding or removing a transmission line or changing the transmission line length does not change the SWR on the line. It does change the impedance looking in the line, but does not change the SWR. And of course, this is not counting any losses that you might have in the line. Quarter wavelength lines are kind of unique in that they do this impedance inversion. And in the extreme case, do that open to short and short to open. And because of that, we find them being used a lot in various RF applications, such as for switches and filters and matching circuits and things like that. In fact, if you take a look at the video that I did on a transmit receive switch using pin diodes, I used a quarter wavelength line as part of that switch. I'll link that video down below as well. Now, of course, the quarter wavelength lines are actually very easy to measure and visualize on a Smith chart. We have the nano VNA set up with uh, three traces. The yellow trace is the log magnitude of the reflection coefficient, or S11. The blue trace is uh, plotting the same thing, but as SWR. And then the green trace is plotting the Smith chart. The unit has been calibrated uh, from 50K to 900 meg. Uh, at the end of these uh, connector savers right here. So uh, we see that the open circuit is showing up on the Smith chart over here as we expect. Now let's look at what happens if we connect up this uh, short piece of coax. We can actually now see a trace going around the perimeter of the Smith chart. So if we move the marker from say the 50 kilohertz position here and move it around upper, higher and higher in frequency we can see ourselves rotating around the chart and we get halfway around the chart, we are now a quarter wavelength away. So we've now transformed this open circuit to a short circuit. And we can see that's occurring at 315 megahertz. So we know that the line that we disconnected here, this you know, 150, 160 millimeter long line, is a quarter wavelength long at 315 megahertz. Now let's attach an SMA connector that has a 100 ohm resistor soldered to the back of it. Now we can see a couple of things. At 50 kilohertz, we can see that we're sitting right or near that 100 ohms, 98.1 ohms, right here where we expect on the Smith chart. And if we go uh, halfway around the Smith chart, essentially up to that same 315 megahertz or so, we've now come around and transformed that 100 ohm resistor into about a 24 ohm resistor. And if we go the rest of the way around the circle here, we can see we'll, we'll return back to that 100 ohm resistor again. Now the other important thing to note, anywhere along this line or with any of these different uh, lengths across the line in terms of wavelengths across the line, our return loss or reflection coefficient is virtually flat and the SWR is virtually flat at around 2 to 1. So this kind of reinforces what I mentioned earlier that regardless of line length the SWR does not change. Now if you look carefully you'll notice that the circle, if you will, does not come back exactly to where it started. It's a little bit closer to the center and we can see it's kind of spiraling in towards the center of the Smith chart. And this difference that you see uh, in the each time we go around the circle here is due to loss in that transmission line. If this was a higher quality line with less loss then this circle would more closely touch itself. The more loss you have, the closer you're going to get to that center. And this uh, brings up another interesting point. Uh, oftentimes, if you're using very old coax or worn out coax to connect up to your antenna, it might always show you a really good SWR because what's happening is the loss in the line is attenuating the reflected signal coming back. So the transmitter thinks it's seeing a good, uh, a good match because it has very little reflected energy coming back. The reality is that reflected energy is being lost in the loss of the coax, 
and it looks like you're getting closer to the ideal impedance. But that's how coax loss is represented on the Smith chart. You'll see this curve kind of spiraling in. Well, I hope you learned a little something today about uh, transmission lines, how to measure the length with this nano VNA, and then what uh, different lengths of transmission line do to the impedance looking into the line, why that happens, and how that's represented on a VNA, like on a Smith chart here, and some of the magic of quarter wavelength lines and how the impedance inverts and how that's also represented. And most importantly, to dispel the myth that changing the transmission line length does not change the SWR even when the impedance is mismatched. If you liked the video, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. And thanks again as always for watching.